And of course, while the Negro does have the dark color of the skin, his hair is curly. We know that apes, if you've ever looked at apes in the zoo, have long, silky, straight hair. Recording here of what we hear. But Negro would kill his father for a few bucks. The only good Indian's a dead Indian. The only good Jap is a dead Jap. All niggers are lazy. Most of them are criminals. Well, they're either cops or gangsters. Either way, they're... You can't trust a Jew. They'll rob you blind. God invented man, but the devil invented German. A Mexican would just as soon kill you as look at you. Frenchman? He has to have sex, and he doesn't care how he gets a Greek. Well, let me... Hi, everyone. Danielle Romero here. We've been delving into American identity, hidden American history, family stories, and how all of these things connect to each other. And today I'm going to show you an absolutely crazy video I found. It's from 1958. It was a U.S. Army surgeon who actually interrogated Nazi war criminals during the Nuremberg trials. And afterward, he was a part of this, I think it may have been like a public television thing. It was talking about all of the different stereotypes that people hold against each other. And it's pretty wild. I mean, you have to think it's 1958, pretty uncensored TV, but I want to watch it with you and talk about it. I only saw the first few minutes and I thought we gotta watch this together. Like, this is amazing. I have a free download for you that I wanna tell you about. I'll tell you about it at the end of the video, but let's dive in and watch this insane video. Does one race or nationality produce more criminals than another? Here are answers to questions about criminality. In this session of our series, Dr. Kelly will study the relationship of race and national origin to criminality. He calls the study the ethnological criminal. So just to pause, so Dr. Kelly is the one who I was telling you about before, and he's fascinated by this idea of mixing stereotypes and criminality, which makes sense given his history, right? Why? Irish extract. Why? Mexican. White. Irish Scotch. Negro. White. Italian descent. White. Spanish American. You know, everyone is circular. Every piece of description about a criminal, every record card, report from a penitentiary carries a racial designation. It goes in hair color, eye color, height, weight, scars, and other marks. It's considered to be very important information. But is it really very pertinent? Is it important to know race in order to identify a person, to apprehend him? What's its relation to crime? We find white, Italian-American, or Negro. Wouldn't it be better to have skin color? Because it varies. Take this Negro, for example. He's very light complexed. And after all, if you were thinking of an individual Negro, you might think of dark, light, shades of chocolate. This might be a lot more important than the word Negro. Why do we have this sort of thing? Actually, it stems primarily from a notion that's handed down from an idea that many Americans had. Okay, so I just want to pause there. Sorry, I had trouble pausing it. So I've thought about this before. My husband and I have talked about this idea that if you were for some reason being chased by the police, how they describe you is probably like that's the man on the street perception, right, of how you are. And we've talked about this and how interesting it is. And he touches on this, but it's black and white, so it's hard to really get the scope of what he's talking about. But he's pointing to these men that he's saying are designated as Negro. And he's saying, well, like, this guy in particular is pretty light-skinned. And it's like, is that really going to help you to identify somebody? And it, it's just really interesting. I have thought about what would someone say if you were running from the police? How would they identify you? And just kind of goes to show uh, how nebulous some of this stuff can be. There was an Anglo-Saxon superiority. Strangers coming in were looked at as being potentially evil and criminal at every time. The American Indian, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Dutch, the Irish, the Jews, the Negroes, the Mexicans. 
these people at some time have been considered potentially criminal. That's basically everybody, right? That's everybody. Self-explanatory. It indicates a feeling of inferiority for this particular group. Or another little sign, it's a little more subtle. But it still conveys the notion of racial difference. A couple of papers in which the word Negro is headlined unmercifully without any reason and certainly without any advantage of apprehension is what one wants. We turn on this tape recorder. We have a recording here of what we hear. A Negro would kill his father for a few bucks. The only good Indian is a dead Indian. The only good Jap is a dead Jap. All niggers are lazy. Most of them are criminals. Well, they're your cops are dangerous. Either way, they're... You can't trust a Jew. They'll rob you blind. God invented man, but the devil invented German. A Mexican would just as soon kill you as look at you. Frenchman? He has to have sex, and he doesn't care how he gets it. A Greek? Well, let me... We can let the tape run. It's filled with hundreds of other statements like this. Statements which attribute evil and criminality to boogies and shines, to spicks and Mexicans, to chinks and japs. We take a globe. But hearing the way that like these slurs are just rolling off this man's tongue are like unnerving, even though he's obviously a man ahead of his time because he has seen things and dealt with things that I think most of us still can't really comprehend um, as someone who was interviewing and kind of uh, get behind the psychology of why do Nazis become Nazis. Take a look at some of the racial pattern. We find people who don't like the German. They're not a race. They're simply a cultural group. Well, we find arguments about race between the people at the Dover Strait in the English area and in the French area. Oddly enough, these people come from essentially the same racial stock. And yet, we find over and over again that people will tell you the Normandy Coast individuals are completely different in their origin from the British. For example, in here, we've got a typical one. The symbolic black hand of the mafia. And here, people say, ah, oh, mafia are Sicilians. Sicilians are criminal. This isn't true. I wonder how many of you, when you think of Sicilians as being a criminal, ever stop and think of the fact that people outside the country think of Americans as gangsters because Chicago gangsters are as well known in other countries as nappy as Sicilians are here. And so we find a very curious thing, the notion that cultures cause crime. And when investigated, we find cultures have no relation to crime but there are criminals in all cultures that may give the culture a bad name, other cultures. What about this racial? We take any book, even the simplest kind, a little pocket book, we'll find a pretty adequate description of different classifications of race. For example, in here is one from the famous classifier, Linnaeus, who classifies Americanus. He adds that the American Indian, they're tenacious, Europius, he's lively and inventive. Asiaticus, he's stern and stingy. And Afer, or African, he's cunning, stupid, and negligent. Here, they have taken the Oriental, or Mongol type, and added in, of course, the American Indian as a result of his origin, and some of the Browns. Then, of course, the next classification, is the African or Negro. And finally, the last classification is the Caucasian or white type. And many people, particularly the uninformed, still feel that if you take, for example, a skull of a great ape and you hold it up alongside a person and look at him, you then try to figure out in what way does he resemble the great ape. Find any resemblances, then you say, well, he looks apish. So he's act, act, act a fish, and in that way, he has to be more potentially a criminal. As a matter of fact, if you consider this problem, and it's been well done in a book, The Human Animal, by Western Labar, you'll find a very fascinating discussion. 
He starts out by defining a typical human as just a person who has two hands, two stereoscopic eyes, two double arched feet. This is a better description. It doesn't get caught in this problem of skin color. And then he points out the Caucasian may have white skin, blue eyes, and vertical faces, and these are pretty far away from apish types, so may be considered advanced or specialized, as opposed to the Negro who is dark-skinned and has a somewhat prognathic or sticking-out jaw. And right away, whites would say that shows that we're further along the evolutionary scale, but if you consider a couple of other factors, for example, the length of the thigh bone and the type of heel. These are two evolutionary characteristics. The longer the bone, the better developed the heel, the more advanced, theoretically, away from the ape. We find that these are predominantly characteristics of the Negroes, of the longest thigh bones and the best developed heels of any. And of course, while the Negro does have the dark color of the skin, his hair is curly. We know that apes, if you've ever looked at apes in the zoo, have long, silky, straight hair. So the Negro actually probably represents the highest evolutionary point from the view of his bones and his hair. And if we take our Mongolian group, our Chinese and Japanese friends, and we look at his nose, which is somewhat saucer-shaped, this, of course, is pretty typical of the animal or apish type, so he isn't very well advanced here. But if we move just a half inch up to his eye, his epicanthal eye pole, this is probably one of the most specialized features. And in this area, he's way ahead of all other humans. Then, of course, if we look at his chest, we find he's essentially hairless. And remember, apes are covered with hair, so the persons who are most hairless essentially are the furthest advanced. There are, of course, a lot of people who simply ignore these scientific findings and will, by offering statistics of a sort, attempt to prove their point. Actually, what they really do is to cheat the statistics by only giving you half of them. For example, here. Here is a set of arrest records from a small Michigan town, the arrest for a day. Look at the names. Zapotaski, Selensky, Wojewicz, Hatton, Sinkowitz, Zofia, Anderson, Riley, Cossack, Wisnowski, and so on. Now, you might consider from this set of cards that the Poles commit more crimes than the non-Poles. But as it so happens in this particular little town in Michigan, the Poles fundamentally outnumber the non-Poles in a large degree. So really, in parole rate, they probably don't commit as many crimes. You see this all over. These things are not new. They have gone on in history for many, many years. If we go back over the history of this sort of thing, we find, and in this cabinet, we've collected uh, hundreds of examples of the problem of history in relation to this thing. Here, for example, is a cuneiform tablet. And on this cuneiform tablet, written many years before Christ in um, Abyssinia, in uh, the cuneiform areas of Mesopotamia, we find a nice description, which is a very deleterious one, of neighboring races. Of course, if you can't read cuneiform, you don't have to worry. You can get yourself a Bible and read some fascinating descriptions of how the Israel tribes didn't like their neighbors. Or you go to ancient Greece. And here, for example, is a nice picture of uh, Aristotle and his pupil, Alexander, discussing a problem which is very common in those days, the problem of the Egyptians as a poor group of people. You know, we have an interesting thing couple of bowls of cotton. Probably most people wouldn't relate cotton bowls to racial prejudice. When Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin and found out how to get the seeds out of cotton, then we suddenly found a tremendous demand for slave labor. Labor that could be worked day and night, constant, cheap. Right away, the Negro was pushed from his status of equality 
to a status of slave, shackled and leg iron. Of course, the white person had to account for this sudden shift in his treatment. He had to rationalize it. And okay, let's just stop there. I, this is incredible. Um, and there's five minutes left. But just this idea of the need to rationalize the reason why we're othering another group. And I thought it was just so interesting. First of all, this guy is a beast. I think he's doing all of this in one take, I think live, which is just incredible. Props to uh, Dr. Kelly. But this idea of having to rationalize and he's he's pulling out these examples like it's nothing. Like the idea that, you know, the Greeks and the Egyptians and the problem of the Egyptians. And I feel like we can use that phrase even now. Look at how headlines are being written. The problem of X. We've got a problem and it's these people. I mean, on some level, I think it's good to look back and say, okay, this is the human condition. This is it. It's that. I mean, has there ever been a time where this was not the human condition, which is disheartening? Let's see where he goes with this. And so to rationalize it, he simply ascribed to the Negro characters of stupidity, laziness, criminality, dirtiness, bad smell, and this then permitted him to treat it in a subhuman way. And if you take a look at the books, you find all sorts of them around the world. For example, here's one, English, Frenchman, and Spaniards, written by a Spaniard, which isn't very complimentary to the other two. And here's a dandy, the English, are they human? This, of course, was written by a Dutchman. Another one, I think most interesting, published in 1904, a book by a very well-educated Chinese, as a Chinaman saw us, in which a Chinaman com complained bitterly about our body odors, and he also points out he doesn't think we'll ever make it as a culture. It's a comforting thing, I think, for Americans to recognize that there are many other countries which are just as good at slinging slurs as our we in the United States. For example, here's one. Trust a snake before a Jew, a Jew before a Greek, but never trust an Armenian. And here's another one. The Germans gorge and swill themselves to poverty, disease, and hell. Trust a German as you would a dog. And here's a final one. Thievish as an American, drunk as a Pole, vindictive as a Corsican, tricky as a Greek. This whole book is a dictionary of such slurs. This brings us to a remote link between race and national origin, or actually a problem in relation of prejudice in relation to crime. To give us some understanding of this background and link, I'd like to have our announcer, Bill Trieste, describe some pictures we took of typical American scenes. This is a typical street in one area of a major West Coast city. Some people call it boogie town. Others call it, more politely, the Negro section. A few call it a disgrace. Here on streets like this live most of the Negroes of the city, locked in by invisible but clearly defined boundaries. Almost every city in America is dotted by such sections, areas populated by people of a particular race or national origin. Segregation of this sort has been declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court of the United States, but it persists finding its strength in cultural and economic patterns. The members of the minority groups are helpless. Their fight against segregation has brought few concrete results. Despite the plainly worded decisions of the Supreme Court against discrimination in employment, in voting, in housing, the practice continues. And when they grow to adulthood, that social education isn't brought. Their employment, their recreation, even their everyday chores such as shopping, are marked by varying kinds of discrimination. Invisible, perhaps, but ever-present. This picture shows a very important thing. While race has no direct relation to criminal behavior, sometimes in a sort of second-hand way, it does. And this is because the majority very frequently oppress the minority. They keep them in a straight jacketed groove, and sometimes the minority person overcompensates and flares back and commits a crime. And so we get a second-hand kind of crime. 
a result not of the basic race or nationality, but a result of the bigoted, narrow-minded treatment of the minority by the majority. And then second, of course, if an individual from one culture has a different pattern of behavior, frequently this is called criminal by the other majority culture. Something important could be done this way to do away with crime by doing away with prejudice. And one simple start might be, for example, to reorganize wanted cards by the simple process of scratching out the place where it says race and putting in the blood type, A, B, or O. This idea was suggested by Boyd in his book, Genetics and the Races of Man. And Boyd's basic point was that the important thing if you must have racial separation, technically, is to use blood types because they can only be told in the laboratory. They can't be told by looking. This would do away with the idea of skin color. It would do away with the idea of saying he's different. So he's... He brings up a point that I've talked about on the channel. My experiences have differed whether or not it's summer or winter. And I understand there are people that, you know, they have the same experiences year round. But for me, like right now it's winter and I'm a lot lighter than I can get in the summer if I'm outside. And I had gone to a new doctor a couple years ago. I shared this story once on here. And we were sitting there and he said something like, well, as a woman of color, you X, Y, Z. And I remember like looking around thinking like, you're talking to me? This was a little while back, and it was before I really had started this journey, before I had really had a, a good sense of my ancestry. And I remember thinking, like, um, what? <laughs> what? But it was summer. But what he's saying here is interesting because this idea of trying to go off color is just kind of a fool's errand in a lot of ways. My husband grew up in Western New York, and he was around a lot of Southern Italians and a lot of Polish kids. And he was telling me that some of the Polish kids would get so dark in the summer, it was just unbelievable. And you realize you have these things in your mind and you don't even realize that you're walking around with them, but they are the lens through which we're interacting with the world, how we're interpreting information. So I, I like the idea of getting away from the color classification. He's got about a minute left and then we'll chat. Inferior, so he must be a criminal. There's no relation between race and criminality. And there's no relation between culture and criminality. And if we use blood types, type we can't see to indicate this sort of thing, then we would be able to do away with the fundamental idea of differences in people, differences in criminality as a result of racial differences. We would be able to recognize the fact you can't tell by looking. Okay, so that was incredible. I want to tell you a little bit about Dr. Kelly. Dr. Douglas Kelly has a really incredible story with a pretty terrible ending, which I think if I was to talk about it on YouTube, the video would get banned. So you can look him up. But he's fascinating. First of all, he was the grandson of the first historian from the Donner Party. He was trained as a psychiatrist at the Medical School of the University of California, and he enlisted in the U.S. Army in 1942, and he had some groundbreaking uh, work treating World War II soldiers for uh, shell shock, essentially. And at the end of the war, he got orders to go to Luxembourg. He was supposed to study the Nazi leaders who were being held there for the Nuremberg trials. And he did the inkblot test with them, and he developed... Uh, his own search for what he called the Nazi personality. He was trying to figure out if these people all had certain traits. And he actually was pretty disappointed with the results of that because he couldn't find that pattern that he was looking for. I thought that that was really interesting to see him here kind of dismantling these ideas. And I think this is something that he personally had wrestled with for a long time and he wrestled with it in the field. Let me know if you're interested in seeing more of these things from the archives. I feel like it's really important to bring some of this old stuff to the forefront and to talk about it and not to make it fresh because it doesn't need me to make it fresh, but to bring it into conversation. I just think it's really important to get these stories back out in front of the next generations 
because I think in the world of scrolling through TikTok and Facebook, and honestly, I don't even know what the kids are using these days. There's probably something else that I'm not even aware of. I'm worried that this this information is going to be lost. And we need this. We we need to be grounded in our history, the good and the bad, to know it, to know where we're coming from, to help us make decisions going forward. Also, if you are interested in saving your own family story, I have a free download for you. I would love for you to fill it out and let me know what you find. So I'm going to leave a link to that below and we will talk soon.